Welcome all for another dose of science. Always a question, do we take a small dose? Do we take a bigger dose? Yeah, I think today we'll take a good sized dose of science. And joining me are Ada McLean and Jonathan Jerry, our regulars. We're going to talk about a lot of interesting things. Ada had a bad experience last night with stitches, so we're going to get some knowledge about being stitched up. Uh, and Jonathan's got to tell us uh, some sound stories about misophonia, interesting business. And uh, of course, we'll have our unusual animal fact, because I know many of you have been waiting with bated breath about whether cobras can spit or not. And um, I'm going to address the issue of uh, plastic bags versus paper bags, but we're going to start out with something else. So let me just uh, share my screen here and we're going to get going uh, with uh, the FDA approval of a new drug. Uh, Aduhelm, interesting name. You know, I, they sit around conference tables coming up with names for these drugs and uh, I'm not sure how they came up with this one. It's not one that just rolls off the, uh, the tongue. But herein lies an interesting story. Aduhelm is uh, a monoclonal antibody. Antibodies, of course, are substances. They're actually very large protein molecules that can detect a foreign invader and destroy it. That's putting it uh, simply. And a monoclonal antibody is one that, that has been specifically synthesized to recognize one specific invader. Well, in this particular case, the invader in the body are these amyloid plaques, which are the hallmarks of, an of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, as you can see on the left, we have a normal situation where you have the nerve cells or, or neurons, and they interact with each other. They release neurotransmitters, which jump the little gap called the synapse in between them and uh, cause uh, activity and messages get transmitted. However, when these uh, proteins called amyloid plaques build up in be between the, the uh, nerve cells, that interferes with the transmission of information. And one of the consequences of that is Alzheimer's disease. So the idea would be to somehow disentangle these amyloid plaques. And this is what the monoclonal antibody does. So we have a new drug here and there hasn't been an Alzheimer's drug approved for about 18 years. So this is, this is big stuff. But there are some questions that have to be asked about this. The approval has been highly controversial. And if anyone has been following the story on social media, you'll be aware of just uh, what an extensive controversy there is uh, over this medication. So let's take a quick look at what we actually know about this. Well, there's no question that with the use of the drug, and it's an intravenous infusion, it has to be done every month. So it will have to be done in a doctor's office or, or in the hospital. And of course, uh, the first thing you want to know is does it actually reduce the uh, presence of these uh, amyloid plaque de deposits? And as you can see, the result here is, is yes. Uh, they have shown conclusively that the plaques have been reduced in size. However, it is also very important to point out that it is not at all clear that these amyloid plaques are the cause of Alzheimer's disease. They may very well be the consequence of the disease. The truth is that there have been all kinds of drugs over the years that have been tried that have targeted these uh, amyloids. And uh, of course, we don't have them because they have failed. All right, moving on. How did they actually measure whether or not the results of, of using this drug are significant enough to warrant FDA uh, approval? Well, they did measure cognition. There are these standard tests that are used and they had a, a sampling of Alzheimer's patients who are very early on in their uh, disease. So um, 
these are still people, of course, who, who know what is going on, but they have serious trouble with, with memory, but they're still behaving in a rational way. So they underwent these cognition tests, and indeed, it turned out that they did somewhat better. How much better? As you can see, a fraction of a point on an 18-point scale. So this is not something that you're going to start dancing around the Christmas tree uh, about. Now, also in, in these clinical trials, it was uh, very clear that any effect was just a slowing of the decline. There was no improvement seen at all. So it isn't uh, really <laughs> that significant when you look at these results. So you gotta take a careful look at the downside of this drug, the side effects. And in the two major clinical trials, 40% of the subjects had side effects. That's a very high percentage. Things like swelling of the brain, headache, dizziness, visual disturbances, nausea, vomiting, and 18%, which is still a very significant uh, amount, microhemorrhages that is bleeding in, in, in the brain. Nevertheless, the drug was approved. I think there was a lot of uh, political pressure here to at least introduce some kind of, of drug for Alzheimer's uh, because there has been nothing for the last 18 years. And even then, Aricept, which kind of has been the, the mainstay, the results are not that great. But here's another point to be considered. This is not a cheap drug. It is very difficult to produce these monoclonal antibodies. So we're talking here about $56,000 per year per patient. Now, of course, uh, in the US, uh, depends on your insurance coverage. Some people may end up having most of that covered, though I'm sure there's going to be a fight with the insurance companies, but they will still have to pay some percentage of this. So there you go. We, we have the, uh, the information. This is no uh, big breakthrough. This is not cutting edge. Uh, this may have some mild effect in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease at a very significant financial cost and possibly at a significant side effect uh, uh, cost as well. But anyway, I thought that uh, it would be interesting uh, for you to know just what uh, uh, is known so far and uh, on what basis this uh, uh, drug has been uh, approved. <laughs> just one other word, because this... Uh, I got wind of this at the same time as uh, the, uh, the uh, Alzheimer's drug was being uh, approved. Uh, and just I, I want to just contrast this kind of thing, which doesn't need FDA approval at all. Uh, this is a so-called natural health product, which can be put out there with basically no evidence at all. Uh, it's called Beyond Silver, Structured Silver. Uh, total nonsense, and as you can see on the right here, uh, they don't make any any claims that are tangible. It provides support to athletes, travelers, and all members of the family within daily life. Yes, well, water would do that as well. It contains 15 parts per million of silver, which is very small amount, so at least you're not going to get argyria, which is the graying of the skin irreversible that you could get with some other products like with colloidal silver. But this is just a marketing gimmick. And uh, I, I just wanted to, to extract one little bit of, of, quote, evidence that they refer to about the benefits here. Germicidal resonant frequency, a non-existent commodity. Silver's natural resonant frequency, similar to ultraviolet radiation and narrow wavelength, destroys the membranes of pathogens and damages their DNA beyond repair. This is a totally meaningful word salad. Uh, but of course, if you don't know anything about silver or frequencies, then it's possible to buy into this, especially when they show you totally meaningless pictures in the ad about what happens to cells without silver and what happens with silver. Total gobbledygook. There's nothing in here that's any meaningful, and they cap it all off with this picture. I can't even interpret what this says. Live bacteria, silver, dead bacteria. Anyway, this is just nonsensical gimmickry, uh, and this one I think we can uh, 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 with confidence say that it's total nonsense to stay away from it. Uh, the Alzheimer's drug, well, uh, it's certainly not as nonsensical as this, but it doesn't have as much science behind it as we would like to see. All right, let's get back to other stuff.
uh, which may be a bit uh, more entertaining and more hopeful. <laughs> so let, let, let's go to Jonathan and uh, get some sound advice. Yeah, so um, I wanted to talk about a very interesting case. I was reading about this in the academic literature. It was a doctor who was reporting on the fact that this, this mother was telling him that uh, at some point her daughter was eating some carrots uh, in, inside some aluminum foil, and the sound of the foil and of the eating of the carrots was so upsetting to her that she started roaring and swearing at her daughter. Uh, and so it's a phenomenon that is, it's not just this one person, it, it, it's actually more, much more common than that. And the phenomenon is called misophonia. Uh, and it comes from the root misos, meaning hatred, and, you know, as in, as in misogyny, as in misanthropy, uh, and phono meaning sound. So it literally means hatred of sound. Now, what it is, is it's a strong dislike of certain sounds, and it can lead to anger, and even in some cases to rage. Now, it's not a hatred of loud noises, but really of certain sounds. And I apologize in advance if anybody watching this suffers from misophonia. You might want to turn off your, your headphones for a few seconds. Uh, but usually the kinds of sounds that will trigger people who have misophonia are things uh, that pertain to the, to the human body. So things like eating. So that kind of sound. Or breathing or chewing or slurping. Sometimes it's even repetitive sounds like tapping your pen, those kinds of tapping sounds. It can be the S sound, that sibilant sound when we speak. Uh, and so those uh, kinds of sounds will trigger this really intense negative uh, emotion in, in people who have misophonia. And sometimes they even get that reaction without the sound just by seeing the visual trigger. They're seeing somebody who's e eating a carrot, for example, and, and their brain interprets this as, as, as the same way that they would if, if, if the sound was actually being, being made. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it can be kind of funny to, to talk about it in the abstract like that, but it, it can actually have some really adverse consequences to people who have misophonia. Some will avoid meals with friends and family because those sounds are just too unbearable to them. Now, uh, it's not the same thing as there's a different phenomenon called hyperacusis which is when somebody has this all around intolerance to loud noises or to sounds at a certain frequency. Um, it's not the same thing as phonophobia, which is the fear of loud noises or of, of specific sounds. Uh, it really is very specific sounds that create this, this anger in, inside of you. Uh, and we don't yet know exactly what causes this at the biological level. Um, something that I was reading about, which I found quite, quite interesting is that when the sound is made by your significant other, it is likely to create an extreme negative emotional response. But when you yourself, who suffers from mis misophonia, when you are making that same sound, uh, there's, there's no response. There's, there's no corresponding response to that. So maybe it has something to do with the fact that you're not in control of, of that particular sound. Uh, there's a hypothesis that uh, misophonia might be a type of synesthesia. And synesthesia is this fascinating phenomenon, this multifaceted phenomenon by which um, a stimulus of one kind of sense or one kind of cognitive pathway also will trigger a different sense. Uh, so for example, people who have synesthesia uh, might see uh, particular numbers as being uh, of certain colors. So uh, whenever they see a zero, it's always purple, for example. This is completely outside of their control. It's just the way that their brain is wired. Uh, and so there's this hypothesis that misophonia is likewise a sort of, of you know, uh, alternative wiring of the brain between sounds and emotions. And that's what this, this, this link is. And it really looks as if misophonia is something that's happening in the brain and not in the auditory system itself. And there was some very recent data that looked at which parts of the brain get activated when it happens. And it suggests that misophonia might be happening because uh, the part of the brain that is linked to the lips, the, to the jaw, and to the mouth movements, uh, that part of the brain gets overly active when people with misophonia see the triggering sound. Like when they see somebody chewing loudly inside their own brain, the part uh, that is responsible for this, it gets overly uh, stimulated. And the, the, the issue right now is because it is so um, understudied, um, there are no evidence-based treatments for misophonia. Uh, there are suggestions of, for example, using sound generators like white noise generators to mask the noises that are, um, that are triggering this. 
or using pleasant sounds or music to distract the person. There's also talk of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is talk therapy with, with a therapist. But there's very little research. And, and something that I found quite um, disturbing is that, is that there was a survey a couple of years ago of 300 people who suffer from misophonia that they call misophonics. Um, and about three quarters of them were reporting that it was actually getting worse over time. So uh, a lot of these people will say that it started in childhood. They started to perceive these sounds that would, that would trigger this reaction, uh, but it, that, that it's only gotten worse over the years. Um, and the last thing that I'll say about this is that it, it's been also hypothesized because I mean, we're at the point where so little is known about it that scientists are hypothesizing and seeing, well, what does, what does this look like? What does it sound like? Uh, so some people have, have, have hypothesized that misophonia might be on the same spectrum as ASMR, but be at the other extreme. So ASMR, if you just go on YouTube and type ASMR, you will see so many very uh, popular videos of people uh, very close to microphones, whispering, making these, these strange, intimate noises. Um, and uh, the reason for that is that some people who have this response, this ASMR, um, they react very positively to these uh, intimate sounds. Uh, and so it's possible that in both cases, there is a strange wiring of the brain happening that in one case with ASMR, it triggers this very calming, positive, tingling feeling. And at the other extreme, these same kinds of noises may trigger uh, misophonia, this very, you know, this, this extremely unpleasant feeling. So again, more studies are needed, but I, I thought that this was quite a, an interesting way of, I mean, again, we were, we were just discussing the brain with Alzheimer's disease and, and how it's, it's, it's so challenging to, to discover new drugs to treat this uh, disease. And in part, it's because we know so little about how the brain works. And misophonia is just one more interesting way in which the brain can work uh, in, in some people. Well, there we have some cutting edge research about misophonia. And now we're going to go to a different kind of cutting. Ada. Well, I mean, it was more stitching than cutting, although I guess the cutting, the cutting kind of happened rapidly and then the stitching <laughs> took a long time. So it's not me, I'm fine. Um, but my, my dear, my poor fiance, he, he got cut on a wine glass, a wine glass broke and he got, he tried to catch it and got cut at about 1 a.m. yesterday. So we hopped in a cab because he didn't want to drive and I don't drive. And we headed to the Montreal General, and he got home about 10 a.m. this morning. And he has uh, six stitches in his finger now and two stitches in his kind of palm area. And he's going to be fine. There's going to be no permanent consequences besides the fact that we don't own these two lovely wine glasses anymore. They were an engagement gift. Um, but it got me reading a lot about stitches in general. I've actually never... Well, I always say I've never had stitches. I had stitches when I had my knee surgery, but I wasn't awake. So in my head, I almost never had stitches. Um, but most people know there are kind of two big um, types, the absorbable and the non-reabsorbable. So ones that kind of your body will break them down on their own. So you don't have to go back to the doctor or the dentist or um, the vet if it's your pet to get them removed. Instead, your body will just break down the stitches over a course of um, about two to 10 weeks, depending on which type of stitches they are. Um, and the opposite are the non-resorbable ones, in which case those have to be cut and removed, usually by a doctor or nurse. You usually go back to wherever you got the stitches in the first place and they remove them. And I was actually very surprised to find out how much the non-resorbable stitches are used. Because in my knee surgery, they use the resorbable stitches um, with, my, with my fiance's finger. Um, those are resorbable. They'll go away in the next six weeks or so. But there are a lot of parts of our body where these re resorbable stitches aren't um, functional. They won't work. Um, so for instance, things like heart surgery, um, the heart basically just moves around too much. The, the non-absorbable stitches are um, much stronger in general. They have greater tensile strength. And so for something like a heart, because it's you know constantly beating and moving, um, you need to use these kind of sturdier stitches. Um, for bladder um, surgeries as well, because your bladder tends to be a very chemically active part of your body. A lot of highly acidic things going through there and it will easily break down stitches if they're not strong enough. Um, but it's really one interesting thing I did find out is that if you're worried about getting a scar, you should actually opt for the non-absorbable stitches, which seemed kind of counterintuitive to me. Um, 
But it turns out that because the stitches, the absorbable stitches are broken down by your body, they can trigger a certain amount of immune reactions. Um, it's not strong. It's not because um, the, the types, um, the materials that we use for stitches are generally kind of plastic like polymers. So they're, they're very, very long, thin threads. Um, traditionally, they were collagen, um, but we don't use natural sources anymore. Um, we used to get that from cows and sheep and other ruminants. But now we use kind of just like a, a synthetic polymer. It's very similar, actually, to what we use to 3D print things like plastic. Um, and they, because they're being broken down, they trigger just a certain amount of immune response, um, which means your cells, there's just more cells being called to the surgical site. There's more swelling, there's more reaction in general. And so you wind up with more scarring. Whereas if you get these stitches that aren't absorbed and your doctor has to take them back out for you, um, you end up with a much cleaner scar because your cells aren't changing so much. They just kind of grow back together as they heal. Um, so it's really interesting. I actually have a pretty cool scar from my knee surgery. So I wasn't worried about getting the, oh, the kinds biggest, of stitches. The biggest risk is the person who's doing the sewing if they're not skilled enough. Mm. And I know I know this because I saw my two doc daughters who are both doctors practicing on oranges. That's what they practice on the suturing. And it takes a lot of hand skill. And there's a, you know, uh, there's a big difference if someone knows how to do it right. Uh, you don't get the, the scarring. So which one of your two daughters is better at it? <laughs> <laughs> One of his daughters is my doctor, so I have a vested interest they're, in this answer. They're, they're both, they're both good. I, I don't know if I, I don't have any personal experience with them <laughs> doing it. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, all right, on to to other things. Uh, I know many of our our listeners in the past two weeks have read or heard about Dr. Byram Bridal uh, from University of Guelph who is actually a very respected uh, professor. He's in the veterinary uh, faculty there, and he has written a lot about uh, immunological reactions, but now he is scaring everyone about the vaccines, and he's written pa uh, documents, uh, not peer-reviewed documents, but he's written papers about uh, how the spike protein is actually dangerous because after a vaccine, you, sh you shed it and and uh, it is also toxic in in, in the body and uh, you know he he's an academic and he speaks very well it all sounds you know very reasonable uh, it has all been criticized by experts and uh, you know we can't really get into the complex details of what this is all about uh, i think at this point all i can say is is that uh, you have to know who to listen to and it doesn't mean that he can't be correct but when you you, when you see dozens of other experts who, who work in this field just dismiss this essentially outright, I think you have to pay more uh, attention to that. Uh, Dr. David Gorsky, who, of course, writes voluminously every day about uh, such issues. He's a surgical oncologist. Uh, he writes on science-based medicine, which is an excellent site, has really taken it apart in the way that he usually do, does, using a thousand words where 10 will do. But nevertheless, you know, uh, he does do a very good uh, job on this. So all, at this point, I mean, all I can say is, is that the consensus opinion is that there's nothing to Dr. Bridal's uh, attack on, on the vaccines. And also, you know, others have pointed out that he did receive a $250,000 grant from uh, Ontario government because he's also doing some vaccine research. So the suggestion has been that, that he is trying to play up his uh, vaccine at the expense of others. We don't know. Well, I just you know, you know, you know, you know what this reminds me of is, is Dr. Hirt van den Bosch uh, that I wrote about, uh, yeah. because it's a very similar situation. The guy uh, trained as a vet. Uh, he uh, was an academic. Um, he also worked as an administrator on some uh, you know, vaccine um, uh, outfits of, of, of some sort. Uh, and then came out, you know, with this letter that he published on, on LinkedIn to the WHO saying, stop vaccination, stop vaccinations. And meanwhile, it was discovered that he was also working on an alternative vaccine uh, against against the coronavirus. So, I mean, we've we've seen this a fair number of times, not quite, you know, the exact same story, but these sort of uh, more fringe figures uh, in, in the scientific community or, or the medical community 
basically scaring people over these vaccines, going against the grain, being contrarians. And, and, and you know, if, if people are looking for where the truth lies there, it's, it's where the consensus is. And there's just, we have so much data on these RNA-based vaccines. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, r- very, very rare events, you know, you can't see them in clinical trials. They might, but, you know, my, what, I, what I've been very reassured by is that, for example, the thing with the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, with the very rare uh, risk of certain blood clots, it was picked up very quickly and was also investigated very quickly. So we have these very good safety mechanisms in, pl- in place, even for very rare side effects. And you always have to be beware of any article that starts with the truth about. Yes, like Joe Mercola's latest it, book, The Truth About yes. COVID-19. It's anything I mean, about uh, uh, Dr. Joe Mercola, who we've talked about before and will undoubtedly talk about again, and you wrote an excellent article uh, about Dr. Mercola. It's an article that we're going to have to spread because I, I, I consider him to be you know, one of the villains of, uh, of the Internet, uh, scaring people out of for all kinds of things. He's, he's, a, he's a vicious anti-vaxxer, conspiracy theorist, and uh, I, I think he, he needs to be uh, attacked. Uh, in any case, uh, by, back to Dr. Bridal, uh, you know, it's, it's not that we can categorically say that, that, you know, he's wrong. But when all of the experts concur that he's wrong, uh, I think there's a pretty good uh, chance of that happening. So the moral of this little story is that, you know, we, we kind of have to keep our scientific scanners going all over the place. And then you see what's out there. And if one person is saying one thing, but a hundred others are saying something else, you pay more attention to, to that. All right, let me share my screen again here uh, because I, I, I want to get back to, to <clears throat> uh, talking about another interesting story. <clears throat> and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the plastic garbage bags, which is another conundrum and uh, of course it is another controversial issue because so many municipalities are banning the plastic bags is this emotion or is there real science well there's a measure of each in in this now obviously nobody wants to see these plastic bags in the trees nobody wants to see them out in the open like this just you know uh, scattered uh we most assuredly do not want to see them in the ocean where they can ensnare wildlife. Well, let's talk, take a little bit of a scientific look here. First of all, the ocean business. Very, very few plastic bags get into the ocean from North America. Uh, this has been well studied, this we know. There are plastic bags in the ocean, mostly from Asia, because uh, garbage collection there is certainly not what it should be and a lot has to be done there. But as far as North America is concerned, very few plastic bags get into the ocean from, from, from here. Well, it is uh, there are several different out. kinds of these plastic bags. Uh, there are the very, very thin ones. And uh, these are the ones that we used to get for free. Uh, they weigh about three and a half grams. There's very, very little plastic uh, in these. So these are the thinnest ones. And these are the ones that are controversial because these are the ones that have been banned. Of course, they can be reused. They make ideal uh, inserts into the garbage can. And uh, they can also be recycled. Of course, you have to have the places where they collect these and they don't have this everywhere. In California, they're very good about this and virtually every supermarket, you can uh, redeposit your uh, plastic bags. These are made of polyethylene or polypropylene. They are eminently recyclable. And of course, you can also use them for other purposes. You can use them to pick up uh, dog poop so that you don't have to buy the bags that are dedicated for picking up uh, uh, dog poop. So they are eminently reusable. I mean, that's what I do. I just crumple it up and I put it in my pocket and I, I reuse the same one. I, they, I, I have some of these, uh, the thin plastic bags that I, I've, reused dozens and dozens and dozens of, of, of times. Now, you will think that with the ban on the, uh, small, on the thin plastic bags, that there would be less plastic emerging from grocery stores. Not true. Studies have been done on this. And 
what is happening is that people are buying garbage bags that they never bought before because they were using the the ones that they were given at the uh, checkout counter. So there is actually right now more plastic in terms of weight leaving the store than there was before because the bags that you buy in, in these packages are thicker and they contain more, more plastic. Then, of course, there are the alternatives. We are urged to use paper instead of, uh, of plastic. This, of course, is a totally emotional issue uh, because paper has the uh, kind of sense of being natural and, and, and recyclable. This has been studied in, in, in great detail. And the uh, life cycle of the plastic bag has been compared to the life cycle of the paper bag. And there's no question that the production of paper has a much greater environmental footprint, more carbon dioxide release, more water used. It is more environmentally friendly. You would have to reuse a paper bag four times to make it equivalent to the environmental footprint of the, of the plastic bag. And I wonder how many people are reusing their paper bags four times. I would venture to, to, to say virtually nobody does that. The thicker plastic bags are now being offered in stores and they charge you anywhere from 10 to 25 cents for these. And the idea is that with that cost, you're more likely to, to reuse it. Uh, these weigh much, much more than the thin plastic bags. They weigh about 30 times as much. So 30 times as much plastic is being used to make these bags. You would have to recycle these far more or reuse these far more in order to make it environmentally friendly. So when you do the cradle to grave calculation, you have to reuse these about 14 times if you're going to derive some benefit from it. Now, if you're willing to do that, that's, that's great. But of course, you can also reuse the thin ones 14 times. I've done that. I've reused it far more than 14 times. The other alternative, of course, is the cotton bag, the reusable cotton bag. And there are issues here as well. This has a gigantic carbon footprint because it is very difficult to grow cotton. It requires a lot of pesticides. Then you have the transportation costs. There's a lot of water used in the, uh, in the processing, and you would have to reuse this 173 times in order to meet the uh, footprint of the, uh, of the plastic bag. If you're willing to do that, that's great. You also have to make sure to wash this out uh, often enough because you don't want to have some meat juice in there one day, and then the next day you buy your vegetables and uh, you contaminate them. And then there's one final uh, issue with uh, the plastic bags, and that is uh, that they end up in landfills. Not a big deal because they are very compressible. They're very light. They make a very little volume in the landfill. And these days with the landfills that are properly constructed, nothing leaches out. So they're sealed in there. That's what we know so far about the, the plastic bags that they, uh, of course, the ideal is to produce less plastic in the first place, because then you don't have to worry about recycling, you don't have to worry about reuse. But we're living in the real world where you need something to take your groceries home. So I, I think that still the best bet is the, the thin reusable plastic bag, and I underline reusable, and I have personal evidence for how many times one can actually uh, do that. All right, uh, let's get back to some, uh, some other stuff. Uh, we're kind of running uh, out of time here, but we don't want to run out of time without uh, getting back to Ava, Ada with some uh, strange uh, animal facts. And uh, we left you last time. <laughs> I don't know why that, why that dog keeps running across the screen. Is there any reason for him? He needs the exercise. He needs the exercise. <laughs> He's yeah. a good boy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's good. All right. We, we are waiting to find out how far we have to stay away from a cobra so it's gonna not going to spit in our eye. So, cobras can't spit, but they also can. It's kind of weird. It kind of depends how you define the verb to spit because cobras have venom. It comes from their fangs. 
and they can indeed project it outwards um, up to two meters, depending on the size of the cobra, even potentially farther. So stay away from cobras. But the way that they do it is not really the same way that we spit. So what we do is kind of use our cheek muscles to take our like saliva that's just kind of produced from our salivary glands. So like it just kind of is in our mouth and we use our cheek muscles to kind of like <clears throat> spit it outwards. Whereas theirs comes straight out of their fangs. So they do the same kind of cheek muscle, um, contract their cheek muscles and project their venom forward. But it's not, you know, I always thought that it was called spitting because it involves spit, which is inherently saliva and they're not spitting saliva. So, I mean, really, it's a technicality. The point is, stay more than two meters away from cobras. That's really the important part here. Because they can get you in the eye with their venom. Yes. Right? They, Although they, they would have to have good aim for that. Right, right. You don't, you don't want to test the cobra's aim, though, right? You, you know what doesn't typically spit? A dog. <laughs> no, but you know what they do often do? They is salivate, I can tell you that. <laughs> yes, they do salivate, <laughs> especially certain breeds. Yeah, they drink antifreeze. Um, they have a habit of drinking antifreeze. It's kind of a very annoying habit because oftentimes cars will leak antifreeze or if you're replacing the antifreeze, you'll spill a little bit and it'll be a puddle. And cats and dogs have been known to drink this. Um, more commonly dogs because it tastes sweet and cats aren't really, they don't have the same receptors for sweet that dogs do. So cats aren't so drawn to it. But nonetheless, at the shelter I work at, we've seen cats poisoned by antifreeze, probably because they were just trying to drink water and it ended up being antifreeze. Whereas dogs are actually directly attracted to it because it does taste quite sweet to them. Um, and un unfortunately, it's also quite poisonous to them. So it's a really fascinating um, treatment. If you bring your dog to a vet clinic and say they drink antifreeze, what do I do? The vet will administer your dog um, some alcohol, just some normal, straight up, basically vodka. Um, I, I assume, I don't actually know. I'll get back to you if I find out. I don't actually know if there's like medical grade ethanol they're using for this or if it might literally be vodka um but the point could be, is that could be any alcohol it could be any alcohol. Yeah. yeah yeah it could be a specific one but i could also totally see that clinic just using straight over-the-counter vodka um but the alcohol binds to the same receptors that the um, antifreeze molecules do but the alcohol binds more tightly so the alcohol is basically able what it is it's it's the enzyme the, it's the aldehyde dehydrogenase uh, enzyme which is more specific for alcohol than for ethylene glycol so exactly. if you flood the system with uh, with alcohol uh, you will reduce the chance of uh, oxidation to the, the to the acid which is really it's oxalic acid which is the killer because uh, ethylene glycol will oxidize in the body to oxalic acid, then you've got to prevent that. Then you prevent that by tying up the enzyme, as you said, that, that uh, causes that. And uh, because the, the enzyme seems to like ethanol more than ethylene glycol, uh, you have a possible solution to the problem. Just one more thing about the cobras. They don't actually respond to music. You know the old uh, the the scene of of the of the swami with the the flute or, and the cobra swaying to it. The cobra is actually responding to the movement, not not to the sound. They don't hear. All right, so don't don't play any music trying to scare a cobra away. Is the moral of that? Run, story. run. All right, more than two we, meters. We have uh, covered a lot of issues here. We've gone all the way from Alzheimer's disease to, to cobras, and we have run out of time. But we will be back in, uh, in two weeks. And, uh, of course, you can listen to all of our previous Dose of Sciences if you just go to our YouTube channel. And, of course, we also invite you to always check out our website, which is uh, mcgill.ca slash OSS, where you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter which is so adeptly put together by Ada. And uh, uh, of course, uh, you get a bevy of information, which is highly entertaining as well, or so we think. And we now have how many subscribers? Ooh, a lot. Half a gazillion. I thought it was close to 20,000. Yes, I think we're, we're yeah. going 20,000. Pretty, pretty good number. And of course, we'll have a lot more after today. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we will see you in two weeks. Bye.